Good evening, guys, wherever you're tuning in from today. Um, I'm just going to give a quick overview um, of Airbus and Boeing design limits. Um, I know the air sale guys are going to give a much more in-depth information about development and modifications. Um, if, if you weren't here for the beginning, my name's Alex O'Brien, um, and I'm the head of business origination here at APTN. So this, these three graphs just give a simple um, showcase here of the errors and cycle design limits um, of the Air, Airbus and Boeing aircraft. Um, so it's just interesting to see how um, each different uh, aircraft has a different design limit. In general, uh, the newer technology has a higher design limit. Um, but of course, this can come down. There's different factors such as fuel and maintenance that can uh, make a difference here. So um, this is just a white paper that's going to be um, added to the members area um, on APTN, and it's also going to be given out in the email. And this is just more information on guidelines and how to actually fly beyond technical limits. Um, really interesting white paper that uh, we'll make sure that we add for um, members to have a look at. So this graph here is just the country aircraft age restrictions. So this displays the difference in um, age restrictions that vary from country to country for aircraft to be exported into. Um, so it's a combination of commercial and technical guidelines. Um, we got this uh, graph from an Ascend survey from a year or two ago. So it's really interesting just to see how some countries have almost a 15 year difference um, in types of air, or age of aircraft that can be exported into the country. So, there are actually examples of um, aircraft that are beyond the age uh, limit in each country. Um, and there are kind of, this, de this definitely just goes down to good relationships engaging with the country CAA. And finally, um, we're gonna be including uh, four or five um, useful links in the email that's sent out. Uh, just further information about aging aircraft and design limits. Um, so I hope those few slides were a helpful introduction and I'll, I'll pass it on to the air sale guys. Thanks Alex for that. That was a very useful introduction. So Iso, uh, you ready to kick in there or you want to share the screen um, with us? Um, yeah. yeah, good morning everyone. I'm, I'm ready to share. It says host disabled participant. All right, that's my fault. One second. Go ahead, it should be working now. <laughs> okay. All right, well, <clears throat> let's get started. Um, I apologize because um, it's, um, I think, uh, four o'clock here, um, wherever I am, 4 a.m. And it, it, it was a late evening. But um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try and make this as brief as, as I possibly can and not bore anyone um, in, in our discussion about basically there's nothing exciting about corrosion. And basically, that's, that's the topic for the day. And we're going to discuss corrosion and aging aircraft, what have you. Um, at the end, should you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, and let's get started, make it as quick as possible, painless as possible. So I, you know, I, I've been in this business for, uh, you know, I just realized this morning how long I've been doing this. And I apparently I've been in this business about 40 years now. And one of the things I remember um, back in the old days, we would start, an aircraft would come in for a C check or a D check. And it wasn't unusual you have 30,000, 40,000, even 50,000 man hours on a C check or a D check on a 706. Thank um, you, muted there, Iso. So, Ron. 
on. Can you get the um, message to, to ESO? I think he's muted the, the audio there. Let me uh, work on him. No, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. All good. I, sorry, I didn't touch anything. Anyway, so what started the aging um, aircraft rule really around, around the world was the Aloha 737. Um, I think it was a 200 aircraft that basically turned into a convertible aircraft flying um, in Hawaii. The National Transportation Safety Board and a bunch of other organizations were involved and determined what caused it. And surprisingly enough, what caused that accident, at least what they think was, that if you listen to the FAA, they believe that the airplane was operated beyond its original design service goal. Um, we think that the airplane, or at least I think that the airplane really not, was not uh, operated beyond design life, that in fact it was maintenance, it was corrosion, it was fatigue damage, it was a mixture of how to the maintenance organizations in those days, up until those days, didn't really, didn't really, weren't concerned much about corrosion, weren't concerned about fatigue damage. But I think that brought up that brought it up to the forefront. The Aloha aircraft later on in 1996, the TW800 flight that exploded over the Long Island Sound in um, New York, JFK, just outside JFK in Long Island, and in 90, 1998, the Swiss Air accident which it's not certain, or either one of these two aircraft, it's not certain exactly what caused it, but the, the FAA and the Transportation, National Transportation Safety Board believe that, um, on the, at least on the Swiss Air, was a wire harness, low voltage wire harness that came into contact with a high voltage generator cable, <coughs> and was the initial uh, spark, and then the dust and debris that was left on the, um, Spark caused the fire, and the fire went out of control, and unfortunately, um, the aircraft crashed. Um, the FAA Transportation Safety Board, JAA at that time, before EASA, I think worked closely to try and come up with a solution on how to prevent future damages. Uh, but as a result of that investigation, the FAA issued about 700 ADs that are aircraft safety related, raging aircraft safety related, which range from changing maintenance programs. Um, maintenance programs prior to these three incidents were basically MSG2 or MSG1. People didn't deal with corrosion the way we do today. People didn't deal with fatigue damage the way we do today. Um, there was no reporting structure. Um, and when the FAA changed the program, approved the MSG3 program, uh, sampling of the program. Um, I think if you look at airplanes today, uh, we've come a long way. Uh, controlling corrosion, controlling um, fatigue damage. Um, so uh, with that said, we'll start, we'll make a quick introduction to fatigue damage. You know, in 2006, as a result of this, um, of those two um, incidents, the FAA, and the National Transportation Safety Board. I think it, um, the British Civil Aviation Authority was involved because it was a 737 and back in early 2000, I think the European experts on the Boeing 737 would, was the British Civil Aviation Authority. They've, they did come up with some type of LOV limit on the aircraft, which I, you know, are, can be found in, I, I, unfortunately, I didn't include the links on, on this um, presentation, but um, they did put in a number of hours and cycle limitation on almost every aircraft. Um, they, yeah. Hey, Ron, thanks. Um, widespread fatigue damage, I can speak from personal experience, 
in an inspector in the early 80s. Hey, thank you. Um, I've had the opportunity to inspect a number of airplanes. And unless you know what you're looking for, it's very difficult to inspect and identify a potential crack. I remember on the first aircraft, a 727 on Stringer 4, looking what appeared to be initially what appeared to be some type of almost someone took a pencil and ran the pencil from rivet to rivet to rivet going from the forward section aft and I believe it was about 40 inches long and two rows of rivets were at 40 to 60, 70 inch long cracks. Just go back Ron. Um, on Stringer 4, when we opened up the string, when we opened up that area, you can see all the metal would just, just fell right through. That aircraft had a potential of, of, of causing, uh, you know, serious, serious, da serious damage. Um, we took the aircraft out of service. We started digging. We discovered, um, that the whole front section on stringer four and stringer 10 from about 360, which is the pressure bulkhead, almost back to the, I think, 780. That whole area needed to be cleaned up and reskinned. But what we discovered later on, on the same aircraft, um, the aircraft was used um, as an actual test bed for both Boeing and the FAA. What we discovered later on was that in the aft cargo pit area, because of water leaking from the cargo doors, because of the aircraft not having uh, sufficient drains to drain the water or the moisture, because of inspectors not being able to identify and do a true, ins uh, true inspection, um, we ended up having to replace all the belly skins from the wheel well area all the way after the pressure bulkhead all around the aircraft. When we did those um, replacements of those skins, it ended up, uh, airplane was down for almost two months. And frankly, I don't remember what the cost were, but I listed some of the primary structure that we should, at any time you're going out buying an aircraft, even the newer aircraft, the 800s, A320s, these are, these are some areas that, should, you know, pre-inspection, if you can get access to it, or if you're doing inspection while the airplane is in, 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 in sea check, uh, and you'll have oversight while the airplane is in sea check, these are some areas that you should consider looking into. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, The Enhanced Airworthiness Program for Airplane Systems. Again, I mentioned briefly earlier that, you know, this is as a result of the Swiss Air Flight. Um, it's also a result, as a result of the TW-800 flight. Um, the TW-800 flight or the Swiss Air Flight really have not been confirmed, but the Transportation Safety Board believes that the, what caused those two airplanes to crash were the wire harnesses, low voltage wire harnesses, making contact with high voltage wire harnesses, creating the spark. Once the spark started uh, in the cabin, once the spark uh, started, what you initiated a fire, it, the fire had fuel. The fuel was the debris, um, the insulation, the dust. No one up until the late 2000s, early 2000s, really inspected the wires for condition or for cleaning. At the FAA, the airlines, uh, leasing companies have done a really great job in the last 10, 15 years of moving into a MSG3 program, going in and inspecting the wires, going in and actually looking at the wires, 
looking at debris, cleaning the debris, looking at cannon plugs, making, making sure the cannon plugs are installed correctly. Um, but up until 10, 15 years ago, this didn't exist. No one looked at the wire. Me personally, I didn't look at the wire. Um, I'm gonna let Ron just talk briefly about SFR 88. Ron, fuel tank. All right, fuel tank. So SFR 88 is all about EWIS and doing your inspections for all your electrical interconnects throughout the wiring system in the airplane. <clears throat> so SFR 88 really took into account the, uh, the wiring for the fuel system. So any type of integration or mixing of low voltage wires and high voltage wires and entrance to fuel systems uh, was part of their main concern was to prevent any type of sparking events or ignition events that could transit through piping, structure, wiring, or anything into the into the fuel tanks on the airplanes. So uh, they've come with numerous amounts of ADs about redoing the wire harnesses, redoing the fuel quantity, indicating systems, and uh, and the whole bit of doing high level inspections, detailed level inspections for wiring over the center tanks, wiring on, on the uh, forward and aft spars and anything that penetrates into the, um, the fuel tanks. So there's been quite a bit of industry change and operating change and then um, OEM change about how they design the airplanes and the systems they design to prevent any type of sparking events or any transit uh, sparks or electrical energy into the fuel tanks, including lightning. So they've, they've done a, a very good job on that on the newer generation airplanes, but the older generation airplanes is where a lot of the problems still exist. A lot of retrofits going on for the um, center fuel tank in, in a lot of the airplanes, the Airbus and the Boeings that have center fuel tanks or even auxiliary tanks in the bellies that deal with the SFR-88. And then one of the main things that came out of the SFR-88s other than wiring changes was retrofit of the uh, older airplanes with some type of protection system, NGS, uh, which is a inerting system or a IMM, which is an ignition mitigation means inside the center fuel tanks. Uh, is there any, anything more you wanna go into ESO? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think we'll get on, we'll get on next one. Okay. Let's move on. One, uh, so uh, next, the aging airplane safety rule, right? So the rule came into effect in 2005. Um, in the States, and I'm not sure, it, this, this rule, I'm not sure if it applies to European carriers. I, I will do some more research, but typically if an aircraft is more than 14 years old, their principal maintenance inspector or a designee, which in some cases would be a designated airworthiness inspector, would have to come in and do an inspection of the aircraft while it's in maintenance uh, and also review of the technical records and technical logs. Not sure if that rule applies to the um, rest of the world, but it certainly applies here in the US. Um, the only problem I find with this rule is in, in many cases, the inspectors from the FAA lack the experience, hands-on experience that the airline inspectors have. And there's always been some confusion between what the FAA requirements are and what the airline requirements are, but it's working. Um, the inspection is done. I think the FAA and the airlines, um, the FAA oversight and the airlines, the inspection programs have, have gone a long way, have changed drastically. In the four years I've been in this business, I think the airplanes are much safer today than they ever been. Um, I think maintenance is a lot better than it's ever been for most most carriers around the world. Um, one, you know, and one, of, one of the things that as leasing companies, we have to take into consideration is every time we look at an airplane, whether we're buying, buying an airplane, whenever we're buying an airplane, we always look at every single repair that was done 
on the aircraft, ensuring that we have the right paperwork, we have the right uh, damage tolerance reports. We have, and, and this is a critical, critical part. And as a leasing company, if you um, own a, a number of airplanes that are on lease, you do an annual inspections, I highly recommend that on those annual inspections, you check those repairs, you make sure you have a, a DTR, a damage tolerance report for each one of those repairs if it's in the area that's required. Um, we typically on our leases, we would always, if we lease an airplane out, we always put in a, and I'll go into more detail later on, we always put in a, all repairs in the pressurized fuselage must be flush repairs or category A repairs. Um, and I'll go in a little more detail about what that means on the next slide, I think, I hope. Um, well, maybe later on, I forgot where it is. Um, you know, we discussed briefly corrosion. I mean, really, for the most part, the structural integrity of the aircraft all depended on corrosion. Up until I think it was 99 when AD, 1999 or 98 AD came out that required um, each operator to have a corrosion control and corrosion prevention program. Um, I was heavily involved with that program, both with the Boeing company and at that time with the airline, the FAA. What it did was um, it helped people, it helped the industry get educated on corrosion. But the other interesting that, hap the other interesting that happened was up, up until that um, corrosion program was released and was made mandatory, people didn't know much about how to inspect for corrosion, where to inspect for corrosion. And one of the things that we discovered uh, back in those days was that um, you, especially in the um, cargo compartments on the skins, because you have a lot of moisture, because there's a lot of um, uh, moisture, both from the le leaking lav, leaking galley, leak, you know, loading and unloading bags in, in, in through the um, uh, cargo doors, you have all kinds of moisture going in there. And the inspectors, you know, we didn't do a very decent job on cleaning up the area. And when they were in there, didn't do a very good job of, of um, adding drain mass. And sometimes they would clean the area. Um, back in the early 2000, I believe there was a, a um, corrosion inhibitor that you would apply, you would spray, which was great because if you clean the area and it was dry and you spray this, it would work absolutely great. But in some cases, what we discovered was the area wasn't cleaned very well and you would spray this um, material over the moisture and it would sit there. And on your next go around, you couldn't possibly see if you had corrosion or if you had cracks because it was filmed. And by the time you discovered that you may have had corrosion, it was very too late. It was, you had corrosion in there. One of the other things that was really important is that if you had corrosion on a frame or a stringer or um, seat track or um, any primary structure, the maintenance manual allowed you to clean up that corrosion. But the big deal there is if you clean the corrosion up, in most cases, you were allowed up to, I believe, 10% for most areas. And I'm just using that as an arbitrary number. So a maintenance guy would go in, clean the corrosion, treat it. Great. You know, five years later, for some reason, you have corrosion in the same area. And a maintenance guy would go in there, clean it up, uh, another 10%, without realizing that somebody are very clean that area. 10% um, of, the, of the allowable length. Now, five years later, you got 20%. Another five years later, it's 30%. And now that area is going to fail. So it was important. And it's to this day, it's also very important that we keep track. Uh, it is, we own these assets. It's very important that we keep track of those repairs. Um, that when the airlines are doing those repairs, so when we're doing the repairs for them, it's important that we keep track of those repairs so, it, it, so it'll prevent catastrophic failures. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Um, fuel tank flammability rule, uh, Ron touched on this, but this is really, um, 
this has been one of the most aggravating rules um, I've come across for its pages and pages and pages of reports. Um, you know, there, you know, especially, and we'll talk about our, our solution to some of these items, but you, the fuel tank, the fuel wire harness, up until this incident, there was no inspection of any type for fuel tank wire harnesses. And there aren't many people that even today will go in the fuel tank and do a thorough inspection of the fuel tank wire harnesses. I think Boeing and Airbus and um, the, you know other organizations that are manufacturing airplanes have done a really good job on the newer airplanes, um, putting in a better wiring system, better shielded wiring systems, um, ensuring that you know at least now you don't have to go in the fuel tank every you know couple of years. I think for the most part on Boeing aircraft, I think the inspection is every 10 years, and I think on the Airbus airplanes. I believe the inspection of the fuel tank and fuel tank wire harnesses is about every 12 years. Um, let's move on. Next one. How are we doing for time? Alan? Uh, time is fine. We're just at 12, 1230. That's fine. We have 10, 15 minutes to go. So it's all good. Okay. All right. All right. I'll rush through this, but you, you know, I can certainly, if somebody has a question, I'm not sure if you, Alan shared the email with, with, Everyone, they, you know, certainly could ask questions later on. We're more than happy to respond as much information as we can, or it's available. Um, I touched a little bit on on um, repair assessment, but I will go into a little more detail. Again, to maintain the value of an aircraft, especially if you're buying a new aircraft, and aircraft do get hit, aircraft do have damage, and most of the aircraft today are damaged. You know on the ramp, um, a cart, a uh, baggage cart, uh, tug or something like that hits the aircraft and causes damage. We don't have the kind of damage on the newer aircraft that we used to have years ago, but it's really important that the classification of the repairs are classified correctly. Most of those classifications are in the SRM. Um, it's also important that we, for every airplane that we send out on lease, we have a book for every repair that's on that airplane with location, size, category, backup documentation. Um, yeah. It's also important that if at all possible, if you're leasing an airplane and when the sales guys are negotiating uh, with the potential customer that you put an agreement, category A repairs only. Why category A? You don't have to do any type of inspection for the life of the aircraft. Um, category B, you have to develop a repair. Um, you have to do a damage tolerance uh, uh, in, uh, report for it, <clears throat> which could, in some cases, depending on the location, depending on the size, you could have an inspection as low as every couple of thousand cycles. Um, in other cases, we've had um, reinspection intervals as high as you know when the aircraft reaches 45,000 cycles, and it all costs. Um, if possible, stay away from temporary repairs. Let's move it on. Next slide. Um, every repair that's done today in the U.S., and I'm not sure how it is in Yasser, the rest of the world, you have to do a damage tolerance report. The damage tolerance report is done typically in the U.S. is done by a DER authorized or the Boeing, uh, Boeing OEM or um, Boeing or Airbus. Um, it'll give you a inspection program if one is required, inspection interval if one is required. You know, and when I'm talking about inspection program, it, in some cases, depending on on it, it typically it's up to the operator what they want, but typically if it's a visual inspection, I'm just arbitrarily using numbers. If it's a visual inspection, you may have a repair that's done every uh, thousand cycles. If it's a NDT such as every current ultrasonic inspection, it, you know your inspection interval may go up to three, four, five thousand cycles. Um, it's 
it's all dependent by the damage tolerance report here in the states the requirement is that if you have a repair you have 12 months to develop a damage tolerance report for that repair and and that's a, another um, area that when you're doing an airplane lease either uh, lease return or delivery if there is a damage tolerance report it's got to make it's typically in the u.s it's attached to an 8110-3 um, it shows that it's approved and it shows inspection interval and the airplane moves on. Next slide. Ah, all right. So I, I wanted to touch base on aging import limits. If you look at that list, most of those countries have put age restrictions and i have yet to meet anyone that can tell me why they put age restrictions why did they put calendar time on it? and if someone could text back and give me an idea i'd really appreciate it so my personal experience with china has been yes there is a rule but yes, it depends on your relationship uh, with the Civil Aviation Authority. And yes, it depends on how you present your records. And yes, it depends on a lot of things. We have had airplanes going into China that were considerably older and are still, even today, there are airplanes that are being imported into China that are considerably older than what their requirements are or what the published requirements are. Um, many countries, um, then um, Africa, they have an age limit. Do they apply it? Yes or no. India, same thing. They have an age limit. Uh, it all depends uh, if the aircraft was, um, where the aircraft's coming from, who the operator in India is, and um, what type of maintenance program and pedigree the aircraft has. Uh, Russia is, is the same thing. And, and the reason I put Ireland, though Ireland is, is does not have an age requirement. Um, I was speaking with Alan last night and um, my personal experience with Ireland, a few years ago, we had a 737-400. We wanted it registered um, in, our, um, in Dublin or in Ireland. The Aviation Authority, um, basically um I'm, I'm going to try and be polite as i possibly can said no we don't have an age limit you can register the aircraft but we need uh these records and we need these records and we need to inspect the airplane and we need to be um it, the short end of it 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 was next to impossible to have the aircraft registered in ireland and I believe most European countries are, are the same way. They're incentivized to get newer airplanes in the system. Um, they believe if they limit the age of the aircraft, um, the aircraft will be much safer. I, I, I totally disagree with that. Um, if you look at, um, and if you look at the age requirements, really, uh, in my opinion, it doesn't make any sense. And if you look at that list that was put up earlier, um, you have most of those countries that have age limitations have government owned airlines. They're protecting the government owned airlines or government subsidized airlines. Certainly Japan is on that list and Japan has done everything it could to protect JAL over the years. I think they've gotten better in the last 10, 15 years. There's no, you know, there was really no competition. There was very little competition. You had two airlines in Japan and that, that was it. And so one way to eliminate competition is to put some type of age restriction on the aircraft, because if you want to get an airline business, you have to go out and buy new airplanes. The OEMs are not going to re reject um, the government because uh, they're selling newer airplanes, but by no means older, older, by no means do I mean that the older airplanes are, are, are any, um, are as safe as the newer airplanes if they maintain correctly. 
that they are maintained correctly. Um, next thing, let's talk about, you know, I, I, I promised I wasn't gonna do a marketing scheme and I'm gonna go through this really quickly, but I just wanted to just give you an overview of some of the things that we're, my engineering team is working on, uh, or we have SDCs or EASA validated SDCs. So we, we developed this, um, and I'll make this brief. How are we doing for time? I'll go to ESO, yeah, fine. No, it's, right. I'm rushing through this. All right, good. All right, I'll try and, and, and make it as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, so we, we, and I am sure most of the um, technical guys that are on the call are familiar that the um, sales guys and the technical guys typically um, don't talk. And, um, the sales guys make a promise uh, to a potential customer and um, then they expect the uh, technical guys to carry on. But um, um, AirSafe, which is a fuel system, uh, fuel mitigation system, we had, we owned an airline up until a couple of years ago and, and the airline um, needed some airplanes. Um, we went to Boeing for a nitrogen system Boeing came back and said, yes, we can install a nitrogen system, but the lead time is, uh, I think at that time was about 12 months. Um, and you'll have to wait. DFA would not give us any exemptions. And, and, if, and we ended up developing a um, fuel tank flammability, flammability reduction uh, SDC. We got it done, we got it installed, moved on, and so on and so forth. Uh, right now, that system is installed in, on approximately 100 aircraft. We believe the system installed is considerably better, more reliable than anything uh, that Boeing or Airbus are putting out. That's my opinion, but uh, I, I strongly believe in that. Um, next item we have is we, um, going back to the sales guys, we um, developed the ADSB out. And this was a um, system that we developed because Boeing lead time was, I think when we made the request was about uh, 16 months. Um, our sales guys had signed an agreement that the aircraft would be delivered with the ADSB out. Uh, and the customer wanted the ADSB out on the aircraft. Um, we, quickly jumped into it. We developed an SDC, got it certified, got it installed in time for delivery of the aircraft. Uh, what we discovered in both of these systems, this was something to that helped our business to lease the aircraft or sell an aircraft, but we discovered that this is a great business opportunity for the company. Um, we, this um, air track, the ADSB out, we've sold I'm not sure, maybe 40 airplanes, 50 airplanes. I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but we have it installed on 757s. Uh, we have it installed on 747s, um, 737s. Um, one of the interesting um, things that happened was a OEM came to us and asked us if we would develop an SDC for ADSB out on one of their airplanes. This is the ODM and we did. Uh, we got it done, we got it developed, we got it done in three months and um, they were very happy and we moved on. Um, next slide is, um, so this is a very exciting uh, opportunity for air sale at this point. We are in the middle, we've been working on this project for about a year now and we're developing a heads up display system unlike anything else that's been out there um, um, we, the engineering was done and one of the reasons why i'm out in the west coast today is that we have started the installation on a heads-up display uh seven for an ng aircraft on a 737 800 the aircraft um, the difference between this and anything else that's out there is that our heads-up display is tied into a camera that will be, that's mounted on the radome that can fly basically with zero visibility, can land and take off with zero natural visibility. The camera enhances the visibility. Uh, you can fly through smoke, rain, snow, fog, um, day, night, day, night, any condition. 
your approach into an airport would be um, a typical instrument landing approach in almost any weather. Um, we're hoping to have it certified down to touchdown and rollout with no visibility. Um, the advantages on, on, on the system is that typically the current um, heads up display is a fixed heads up display that if you're sitting straight looking forward, if the captain um, is sitting straight looking forward, you can see the heads up display and what it does is basically that heads up display gives you the uh, whatever, you, whatever you select as the pilot, the primary flight display panels, it'll, get, it'll be transposed on that uh, heads up display. Well, in our system, in addition to being transposed on that display, if you move your head 180 degrees to the left or, 180, or to the right, you never have to look down at your instruments like you would with a uh, heads up, uh, heads, fixed heads up, heads up mounted display. So we think that's an advantage. I think in certain airports here in the States um, and certain airports in Northern Europe and some other parts of the world, um, China and a bunch of other things, I think there's a, 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 an opportunity there. Um, we're hoping flight testing start uh, next month. Um, and hoping to have certification and approval by the end of the year. Um, and it'll be a 737NG. Um, uh, we also started uh, the A320 family uh, with the engineer started on that. And we're going to launch the um, 757, 767 um, SDC as well in the coming um, 30 to 60 days. Um, that's all I have. I want to thank you all very much, and I apologize. I, I, I had to rush, and I was trying to get as much information as I possibly could on this presentation, but um, um, it Sorry. may have been a little boring, but I want to thank you all very much. Thank you, Issa. That was a really good uh, uh, overview of aging aircraft corrosion inspections, and uh, really appreciate your time getting up so early on the West Coast to, to be with us today. Uh, and thanks, Ron, as well. There's a few questions that came in there. I'll go through them quickly if, if, uh, if we can do that. Uh, sure. I think answered the first one. Uh, there's a question from Ibengi there. Based on your experience, what are core reasons for fatigue damage? Does flight duration or number of landings influence uh, on fatigue damage? And I think your response was it's cycle, cycle, cycles, I think, yeah? Cycles, cycles, cycles. Yeah. Uh, That's it. Uh, uh, Ashke says thickness keeps decreasing, so thickness measurement is critical. Would you agree with that? Oh, it's very critical. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, one from Owen Healy down there in Brisbane in Australia. If the OEM can only approve Cat B repairs and are not willing to reclassify a repair to Cat A standard due to damage tolerance, then does this warrant a further skin change to allow the new lease contract to continue? <laughs> I, I, this one, yeah. <laughs> that's that. That's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> right. I let I let Owen come back to you maybe separately on that one if you want. Yeah. To. Yeah. Yeah. Would you please? Yeah. No problem. Uh, interesting comment here from Patrick Leopold. Most age restrictions are political in his experience. There's nothing to do with technical evaluation. Philosophy here is new aircraft equals more reliable, safer aircraft. Unfortunately, maintenance does not seem a focus. I suppose you would agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it, it's always been political. Yeah, because it, it, think about it. Age really doesn't. What does it really mean? It, if you if you if you take two airplanes, that if you take an airplane that's been maintained, it's been in the hangar its entire life. That airplane will last well into 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. What kills that aircraft are the number of cycles up and down, up and down, up and down. That's what kills the airplane. So yeah, then interesting kind of uh, uh, take on, on the age limit as well from Janor. Uh, he's saying that his memory serves him right. The age restriction can cause by the route which airlines take. For example, if an airline went to fly to Saudi for Hajj, the maximum age of the aircraft is 20 years. Again, that's a political uh, <laughs> as well. So, yep. so uh, thanks guys very much uh, for, for that. Uh, if you have any more questions, uh, we'll, um, ESO and Ron's contact details will be on the um, follow-up email. I just want to give you a quick overview, as I mentioned, uh, on APTN now, and I'm going to just show up the poll, which is some topics for the next call, which you can um, click on while I'm going through the uh, going through the APTN stuff. So uh, I'm going to 
click on the poll first there, and then I'm going to share first screen here, which should be this one. Okay, so uh, the first slide here is a, um, where's the slide showing it? It shows you the APTN LinkedIn page, uh, lots of growth and the numbers up to 1,600 members uh, over the last week, uh, lots of new additions to the, to the team. We also have a corporate page, which is shown at the bottom there. And uh, these pages in LinkedIn give day-to-day -day updates on APTN news, and we post info on the upcoming talks, articles, and podcasts. And it's there to spread the public awareness of the APTN network. Uh, we're trawling through various uh, sources to find uh, people who could join the APTN network. Uh, this slide here is from about a month ago. I think we have over 9,000 kind of uh, contacts which we're reaching out to to uh, see if they're interested in joining the network. Ideas to try and have APTN members in all countries in the world and uh, we'll keep you updated on that. From, from these 9,000, like I said, we're up to 1,500 on the, on the uh, LinkedIn um, group. Uh, and then on the, the IT platform that we've developed, we have, we're heading towards the 400 number. So this chart here shows you uh, in gray, the, the LinkedIn hub um, membership up to 1,500. The platform, like I said, is approaching 400. The goal is to try and have uh, 1,000 members of the platform by the end of 2020, and we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, we also have a region of WhatsApp groups, and uh, any of the members that are on the platform will get a message asking them if they want to join one of the regional groups. And we have some uh, interesting success on the WhatsApp groups in the last few weeks. We had a request for Boroscope in Taipei. We put a message out to the Asia group, and we had within 20 minutes three or four options for Boroscope guys in uh, Taiwan to do that job. So yeah, membership subscription, ATP individual membership is free for 2020. So feel free to join enterprise membership uh, for lessors, airlines, MROs. Talk to us about that. We're flexible on it. So that's it on the, the presentation of um, the APTN side of things. I'm going to stop share there. I'm going to show you one other slide, uh, if I can, which is some of the demographics on APTN membership. And uh, I've back on to all windows. Okay. Uh, right. I'm going to skip on that one thing. I think we leave it there. I think that's a, a good overview of APT and where we're at. Uh, we'll share more info with you on the next call. Uh, hopefully next week uh, we'll have a talk on aircraft redelivery. Seems like uh, over 70% want to hear some somebody speaking about that. Uh, PMA, DERs maybe on a future call. Uh, helicopter leasing, not a lot of interest in. <laughs> So yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a look at those topics next week. Thanks, uh, Iso and Ron, again for your time this morning. Thanks uh, to all of you. There's over 40 uh, participants today, which is good. And we'll circulate the info on the call, on the follow-up email, and you'll also see it on the APT and YouTube channel over the next day or two. So thanks again, guys. We'll let you go and um, see you soon again. All right? All right. Thanks a million. Cheers. Bye. Bye.